Hi everyone, Stepan here. Today we're looking at Karokan games by Mikhail Botvinnik, the most famous Karokan player of all time, the only world champion who used the Karokan as his main, main, main defense to e4 in every single world championship match. In fact, his most famous world championship match, the 61 uh, rematch against Tal, he used the Karokan in every single black game except for one, where he played the French and got destroyed and he won that world championship match convincingly. So we're going to be looking at uh, his games in the Karo Khan versus two very strong players, Mislov and Tal, very different players, and we're going to be following Botvinnik's games throughout three world championship cycles. So starting with the 58 uh, match against Vasily Smyslov, so this was a rematch, and Mikhail Botvinnik had lost the title to Smyslov in 57, uh, he was allowed a rematch, and the rematch was, melting, uh, was held in Moscow. And Botvinnik started with three, trade wins, three straight wins, and out of the three games, two games he had black, two games he played the Karo Khan, and I'm going to show you uh, the two games at the start. So imagine today, uh, Carlsen is playing Caruana, or Karyakin, or whoever, in like the 21st century, and one side starts with three straight wins, two of them with the black pieces and with the Karo Khan. People would be playing the Karo Khan and nothing else. Well, that's how everybody felt at the time, I, I think. And not only that, but Vinik's play was, especially in the first game, extraordinary. Okay, uh, after we look at the Smyslov games, we're going to have a look at Thai games where Thai is playing Thai stuff. So firstly, he's playing the Thai variation in the two games, so H4 against the advance. And in the first game I'm going to show you from the 1960 match, uh, he sacrifices a piece very early on for very strong compensation. So first we're going to see very, very typical Botvinnik technique, and then we're going to see very typical Thai craziness against Botvinnik. If you can hear church bells, it's Christmas Eve, so happy holidays, and I hope you hope you like the video. Okay, first game. So Smyslov starts e4. This is the first game of the match. So, well, he has white. He doesn't want to lose. c6, knight c3, d5, knight f3, two knights, and Karpov used to take on e4 mostly. And most people take on e4 nowadays. Uh, bishop g4 is the main move, though, and I feel it's the best move. Okay, h3 played, mainline stuff, takes, queen takes, knight f6. Alternatively, you can go e6. e6 is uh, the main line. Knight f6 sort of provokes white into playing e5. I don't want to go into those lines in too much depth. They aren't good because you're basically giving black a good French defense by closing down the center, or you have to give up a pawn. So if e5, knight to d7, unless you go e6 here, black is going to go e6 and then c5 and knight c6, and it's going to be the perfect French without the bishop on c8. So don't be tempted well, into playing e5 here. Okay, uh, d3, I did press something, uh, like practice, okay, let me turn that off. Okay, so d3 played, uh, and this is fine, now we just transpose into normal d3 lines, and in my opinion, these are the most annoying lines to play against. I'm going to show you the setup I don't like to play against. So, white plays bishop e2 here, that's not very precise. White should play bishop d2, and after knight bd7, White should go g4, which is answered either with g6 or h6. I play h6, and then white castles queenside. And in my opinion, it's impossible to equalize for black. It's impossible to have a calm game. You just have to play either queen b6 or bishop b4 or queen c7 and start something on the queenside very quickly. Otherwise, the space advantage is just huge for white. Uh, but okay, Smyslov did not do that. He played bishop e2, and this is slow. Now you're allowing black a great Karakhan pawn structure or a semi-slav pawn structure, whatever you want to call it, but the bishop is gone. Knight bd7, queen g3. I faced this line. It's not that great. Uh, it prevents bishop d6, but it sort of provokes black into playing g6 and putting the bishop on g7. And this diagonal is quite strong. So the queen on g3, in my opinion, not too useful. 
also you're making it kind of harder to to do stuff on the queen side because your queen is all the, all, all the way over here but there's a logic to it bishop f4 and now the idea is you, you want to go bishop c7 you want to dislodge this queen and then go bishop d6 and kind of prevent black from castling uh, you have to be careful though if you don't do something now then knight h5 is coming uh, so in this position if knight h5 is played uh, that's just not good bishop h5 uh, so as long as the e2 bishop is there white is safe and white is threatening to do all of this stuff so bishop f4 played and queen b6 getting away from queen c7 at least putting the queen on an active square Rook a b1, you don't want to go bishop c7 straight away, losing your pawn. Castles, and now black managed to get away with his king. Black did not allow bishop to d6. Of course, you couldn't just go bishop d6 here, because black takes, and, and then the knight is hanging, and this bishop is wide open. And I'm not saying we should castle queenside, but we could, because, I mean, it's scary. I wouldn't, but it's possible. At least black got a pawn and the knight is loose. So queen b6, rook a b1 defending, castles, bishop c7 chases the queen away, and queen d4. This was, I believe, still sort of theory at the time, but I'm not sure. Uh, bishop f3 played, e5. Very thematic. You want to expand if you can expand. You, you're either going to exchange on e4 or play d4 if the knight cannot reach c5 easily, which means that if you close the position down with d4, then white should break it open with f4. So taking on e4 is actually quite simpler because an eventual f4 would lead to a bad isolated pawn position for white because having a king's pawn isolated uh, is, is not easy to defend. I mean, the knight is already on f6, the rook comes to e8, maybe knight c5. Okay. Bishop d6 played, I don't like this move because it chases away uh, black's rook to a very natural square. And bishop a3, that was the idea, getting the bishop out of harm's way. Okay, d4, d4, and b5. Now, this is, well, a hard move to meet. Uh, you have to do something if, if allowed, black is going to go b4. And what's even worse is that since this rook is on b1 and this pawn isn't defended and this queen is over here everything is sort of misplaced even though the pieces are on the third rank and white has the bishop pair it seems like white's pieces aren't doing anything this bishop is on a very nice diagonal but it's very bad it's a tactical liability it can be trapped it's not targeting anything we shouldn't mention that this bishop is bad because it has e2 and d1 but what use is that the queen is misplaced. The knight doesn't have any squares apart from e2, so not a good position. So you have to do something. Smyslov played rook fd1, chasing the queen away to b6. Now, you're not threatening uh, to go b4 because of knight a4, if white can play knight a4, so white played b3. Not only giving himself knight a4, but also bishop c1, rerouting the bishop to a much better diagonal. So if b4 now, then knight a4. And, I don't know, queen a5, bishop c1, this is okay. If the knight moves, knight c5 is coming, followed by knight d3, maybe knight b2, knight d3, if the queen moves and the pawn is defended. So b4 is sort of over committing. Okay, so after b3, Botvinnik played excellently. This, this is my favorite part of the game. And this game is one of the reasons I started playing bishop g4 against the two knights. Uh, because it's just... A perfect example of just how good black's game can be if black gets rid of the c8 bishop in time knight c5 now this knight is very strong and it's looking at the two biggest weaknesses in the white position you may be confused by knight c5 but this knight is coming to e6 and f4 and d4 are not easy to defend especially because this knight can also control f4 Bishop c1, controlling f4, fine. Uh, queen c7, uh, getting the queen to a better square, defending, basically. If in this position... Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, the queen couldn't move now because the knight was loose. So, okay, after the bishop moves, the queen can move. Queen c7, bishop e3, and knight e6. He could have, instead of queen c7, already played knight e6, but this is also fine. a4, I agree with that, you want to break down 
the queen side control a6 of course you, you don't take activating the rook and now b4 b4 is kind of suspicious i think because it gives away c4 not that black can easily control c4 but if we imagined a knight coming into c4 or a4 later on that could be devastating so probably white will have to control the b6 square in the future at some point or black can choose to just take uh, and we can see for permanently but that would give away the outpost in my opinion white shouldn't take on b5 because that gives away c4 forever but that's exactly what happened a bit later on so i don't think something like this could happen in a world championship match today but that's the reason it's instructive uh, smyslov made a lot of mistakes rook ad8 natural bishop e2 covering c4 uh, and putting pressure on b5 queen e7 uh, attacking b4 and uh, you cannot really uh, play queen takes e5 i think because if queen takes e5 then knight h5 and you just lose the knight that there is probably something more precise but this should be good enough uh, I, I don't know so a takes b5 and this is extremely anti-positional uh, after a takes b5 th this c4 square is just gone it's just gone now you're giving away all of this and all of your pieces have to be defending these squares whereas the only square black is giving away really is the c5 square and if something lands on c5 you just take double up white's pawns and your position is great so very anti-positional play by smith rook d8 rook d8 and botvinnik was known for being a very technical player very precise player he would study for hours he would uh, prepare for his games i believe more so than any other player at the time and he would basically try to try to outplay his opponents before the game even starts whereas smyslow i think wasn't like that i think smyslow was sort of a free spirit and you know la, la, la. not really i'm exaggerating but they 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 were very different okay bishop b6 putting pressure on the rook rook a8 claiming the a file very good and now it's very hard to suggest a move for white um when i was analyzing this position by the way the same tactic still works if, if queen e5 then knight h5 when i was analyzing this position i wanted to go queen e3 uh or i wanted to go bishop a5 and this is actually the move i liked the most because the rook now doesn't have a single open file and i couldn't see how black makes progress uh, well that then i saw how black makes progress you can actually start redoubting this knight into the center you can go knight d4 and after something like bishop d3 you can get the other knight to e6 uh, although slowly you can do something like this uh, and this control is too much especially if the bishop cannot contest it because whenever bishop b6 is played then we either have rook a3 or rook a2 still i think bishop a5 was a very good idea instead smyslov played f3 and f3 is such a weakening move that on their level and especially on the world championship level today this is resignable why well you're giving away some more squares but more importantly you're giving away this diagonal forever and this knight is loose and the pawn is pinned to the queen and you're not covering the f4 square anymore knight h5 now comes with tempo and you cannot take so this is a dreadful move giving away f4 giving away a3 and this uh the third rank and weakening this diagonal and making this bishop much worse now the bishop can go to f1 d1 and d3 and this knight can only go to d1 so d definitely not good rook a3 played queen e1 played defending the knight bishop h6 very good claiming the newly weakened diagonal if the bishop moves away now we have a check maybe if we get our queen somewhere over here we have queen uh we have bishop to d2 uh bishop f1 played again hard to suggest to move knight d4 if you take this knight uh you're gonna lose with tempo so bishop takes pawn takes the knight has to go to e2 then bishop e3 check king h1 we just go rook a2 and this 
that this is game over. This bishop is just too strong compared to bishops. In opposite colored bishop middle games and end games, the one the side that's attacking always has the advantage. And I'm going to repeat that a million times. In this case, this bishop is a monster, very close to creating a mating net. If we could imagine, let's say, a queen on a dark square, let's say c7, followed by knight h5, knight g3. So all we have to do is basically sacrifice our rook for the knight. Or in other words, the knight cannot move. If the knight moves, queen c7, knight h5, knight g3. It's just unplayable. Okay, so the knight cannot be taken. He played bishop c5, chasing the queen away, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, queen e6, bishop d3, saving the pawn, but uh, knight d7. Uh, now you either take or you lose your bishop or you lose a pawn because uh, if I take on c5 then I'm, I'm gonna grab that pawn and he ended up taking on d4 which is the same thing as before the bishop comes to e3 it's, it's the same position the difference is that the bishop is not on f1 it's on d3 king h1 knight e5 uh, bringing the knight back I would have played knight f6 because I, I like the idea of coming to g3 but okay, knight e5 is fine, uh, prepares to, to grab a pawn. He played queen d6, basically putting pressure on, on the c2 pawn and the b4 pawn at the same time. f4 was played, knight d3, c d3, rook d3, wins a pawn, queen f3, and at this point it's, it's just game over. Uh, rook d2 was played, the rook is too strong, the bishop is too strong, the queen is too strong, there's a passed pawn on d4, black's king is perfectly safe. You cannot really even go rook a1 and try to claim the diagonal because I'm just going to take on b4 and you don't have enough attack. So rook f1, Smyslov tries to open things up with f5 and complicate on f7, but it's a bit too late. Queen b4, uh, e5, queen c4, threatening to take the knight, so knight g3, and now rook c2, the simplest move, just wanting to exchange rooks. A queen alone cannot do much damage. Especially if our queen comes to c1, then we're mating on g2. So the game ended f5, uh, rook c1, e6, f6, fg6, rook f1. Of course, knight f1, if you trade queens, it's over. hg6, queen f6, threatening to take on g6. And but winning just plays b4. Uh, this is very nice. Uh, the, the g6 pawn can be taken with check. But it doesn't lead to anything. If you take on g6, which I would have done because it's a pawn with check, and then king f8, queen f6, king e8, and the king is just going to come over here and the pawn is going to queen. Uh, you can never undefend your knight. You can also never move your knight. Like, if you move your knight here, then it's game over. Uh, so you cannot move the queen away from the f file. You cannot move the knight. Uh, you can take the bishop, but you lose because I queen my e pawn. So instead, king h2 was played, uh, g5, saving the pawn, <coughs> knight e3, takes the pawn anyway, but this is, uh, this is just too much. The b pawn is too strong. In a queen endgame, if your queen herds a passed pawn forward, then you basically resign, which is what Smyslov did a few moves later. Uh, this is how the game ended. A couple of checks, and then eventually, when the checks ran out, uh, b2 was played and Smyslov resigned. That's it, you're threatening queen e1 and b1 equals queen. I thought this was an extraordinary game, uh, extremely precise, and nothing special was was done. That's what I like about Botvinnik's games. There are no flashy moves, there are no uh, like out-of-this-world ideas that are hard to understand. Everything he does is very simple and very understandable. That's, in my opinion, that's what makes him, Anatoly Karpov, and Magnus Carlsen similar when it comes to style. You understand their moves, but you couldn't play like them because you're not strong enough. But when you see their moves, you don't have to think about what they do. I think simplicity is a great virtue in, in chess. Okay, next game around three so uh botvinik crushes smyslov in round one in the karo khan in round two uh smyslov had black and he played the king's indian and got destroyed uh, you can see that game it's a very very nice game and in round three smyslov with white 
Again, e4, c6, knight c3 goes for the classical. d4, uh, d5, okay, sorry, d5, d4. d takes e4, knight takes e4, and bishop f5. So in the previous game, after d5, he had played with knight f3, going into the two knights. In this game, he played d4. So in this position, you can go knight f6, knight d7, or bishop f5. Bishop f5 is considered to be the main line. And the slight surprise by Smyslov, I, I think this must have been some sort of weird preparation, but I just I don't understand it. So the main line goes bishop g6, h4, h6, knight f3, knight d7, h5. This is one million grandmaster games. h5, bishop h7, bishop d3, bishop takes, queen takes. And what white is saying is, you played bishop f5, bishop g6, bishop h7, bishop d3. A couple of moves with your bishop, and I moved my bishop once, from f1 to d3. Therefore, I'm up in time, I'm up in tempi, which is true. However, in exchange for that, black has a very good endgame. So if the pieces disappear, this is a good endgame for black. Everything is safe. Perfect Karo Khan without the light squared bishop. And we're not even down the bishop pair. We traded bishop for bishop. However, in this position, instead of h5, he plays bishop d3. And I've seen this once before, but I always assumed this, this was a theoretical mistake. I just don't see why you would decide not to take more space if, if you can. So, okay. Of course, bishop takes queen takes and queen c7 and white had lost basically one tempo less because this pawn isn't on h5 and the bishop had to move one fewer times and in the bishop f5 karo khan if you've ever played this uh usually what people do is knight f6 e6 bishop somewhere castles king side and white starts pushing the pawns it's helpful to have this pawn on h5, actually, because it helps the pawn storm. It prevents the h pawn from moving forward. So black needs to be careful here. When I played bishop f5, and I still play it sometimes, I always play queen c7. Although the position is slightly different because my white's pawn is on h5. And I always start with e6. I go e6, knight f6, and then queen c7. But queen c7 is useful here because it prevents bishop f4. So, okay, uh, bishop d2 played, knight g2 f6, and white castles queen side. Now, that's not no surprise. In these games, uh, white usually commits the king first, and white never castles king side, very rarely. Uh, and my philosophy is, for these games, you castle the same side as white. That way, you're not getting destroyed. The engine says, going for king side castling as black is fine. But for a human, you have to play 20 precise moves, not to be worse. And there are so many games where black got crushed on the king side from this position. Okay. e6, king b1, castles, queen side. Okay, I like that. c4, normal. c5 is still theory. You have to challenge that center. Bishop c3. Now you can imagine if, if the king was on g8, <laughs> this would already be quite scary. Knight e4, g4, g5, very, very natural attacking position. And this is the same thing that happens if black chooses to castle kingside. So why would you choose to castle kingside? Okay, uh, cd4, knight d4, a6. I don't like a6. Uh, it prevents knight b5, but it's a very weakening move. And as we're going to see, Smyslow had excellent chances in this game, but he'd misplayed it. And this is one of the reasons this move a6 uh, the engine plays a6 and the engine doesn't see white's ideas the engine says a6 about equal white is plus 0.5 but it's very hard to play this uh, i i like the move knight b6 because it doesn't create any weaknesses uh, we can trade pawns i mean in this position, if you go, if you go knight b5, then I just go rook d3. So you couldn't do that. I've just discovered my rook. So if you want to prevent knight b5, then why not knight b6? And it's it's with tempo on a pawn, and I'm threatening e5. So I, I like that. The white should 
play something like queen c2 here and after let's say queen c2 queen takes c4 uh, let's say b3 the queen moves away to c5 black is a pawn up it doesn't mean much it's not a strong pawn but still i i would never go a6 so this is i think the first problem even though the engine says it's fine queen e2 get, getting away from the pin down the d file bishop d6 developing a piece fine knight e4 this is thematic this knight trade and black gets to develop his knight from d7 to f6 after this this is normal queen e2 rook d7 black wants to double down down the d file okay i like rook c1 and now we can see the problem with a6 once the white pieces start lining up on the c file and once the c pawn starts moving forward we no longer have the option to close the position down we have no options if c6 happens our queen side is completely busted a6 is under pressure very hard to play this if white manages to go c5 c6 so queen c5 blockade okay knight b3 lifts the blockade and queen f5 was the idea okay uh, the rook comes to c2 that's okay king a1 was also okay but rook c2 prepares to double and you can expect the queen to leave f5 at some point so i think this is more time efficient bishop c7 uh i don't know what to say about bishop c7 it just allows c5 i wouldn't do that uh it seems scary although c5 is already allowed if if for example i don't know rook d8 and c5 and you cannot really take because of bishop f6 uh, or even uh, bishop e5 i think this is even stronger uh, so you cannot take but bishop c7 doesn't control the square anymore i would definitely consider something like knight e4 this would be for me a very natural move giving away the g7 pawn and trying to go rook g8 and, and rook g2 because i'm preventing c5 the engine says white is plus 0.7 after knight e4 so it's not a good move it says instead of knight e4 bishop c7 is best but again even though bishop c7 is the best move i don't really psychologically like giving away the c5 square or more of the c5 square but it doesn't lose the tempo so okay bishop c7 c5 and rook d5 now rook d5 is actually a mistake uh, i think a good idea here if you see what's happening is to trade queens uh, i think any human who's been playing the karo khan would play queen d3 here you trade queens and the attack isn't happening anymore if c6 is played then you play bc6 and okay you're gonna survive instead he played rook d5 and after c6 this is getting very scary you cannot play b6 that's the problem with a6 a6 is extremely weak so he played bishop b6 uh all sorts of discoveries now uh and the position is just almost winning for white with precise play white should play rook c1 rook hc1 and let's say rook hd8 which seems normal knight d2 uh, and eventually you're gonna try to unpin with king a1 so i believe black should go rook c5 and try to fight for the c file and let's say cb7 king b7 you can see that black's king is way less safe than white's king uh, white's king is perfectly safe you go king a1 and this is huge so i think smyslov could have played for a win with rook hc1 here instead he played knight d2 which isn't bad white is still slightly better but it's not precise and now queen d3 okay knight c4 uh attacks the bishop so bishop c7 queen takes d3 rook takes d3 and knight e5 okay uh the position is at this point equal uh after rook takes d3 uh white should play something like cb king b and maybe a3 to gain some loft continue with rook c1 you still have you're, you're still fighting for the e5 square and if you can get the, if you can get the knight to e5 at some point then of course that's good but you have to be careful instead of that he played knight e5 immediately missing 
a beginner's tactic. This is like 1500 tactics or even less. I don't know. Just remove the defender. So Botvinnik just took the bishop and that's it. That's the end of the game. They played on for a couple more moves, but it's it's just your piece down. King b7, rook c3, bishop e5. And this is just two pieces for a rook, which is huge. And it's a very simple position. Okay. This is how the game ended. He created weaknesses all over the board. He provoked white into moving all of the pawns forward with, with moves like knight f4, and then knight h3, and then knight g1, and then knight f3. Now this pawn is fixed. Eventually, he's going to be able to pick it up. Let's say uh, knight d4, knight, knight f5. a4 played, knight d4. Rook d2, knight f5. a5. Bishop e3. Uh, Pawns are starting to fall. Uh, he played bishop f2, which is nice uh, because you gain a tempo on another pawn and your knight keeps defending g7. b5, king c7 attacks the rook. Uh, and yeah, now it's very, very simple. He blockaded the pawn. You can never push uh, even if the pawn is defended. If you. Even if black allows something like this, let's say. Let's say something like this. This is just gone. It's over. It's game over. You, you just you're gonna win these pawns and and, and play uh, play h4 and queen. But he didn't allow it. There's no need to. He just set up a perfect blockade, putting his knight and bishop to control a7 and locking in the rook completely. Now white can only move the king. This is a very nice Tsuk Tsvang. If you move the rook, you lose the rook. If you move the pawn, you lose the pawn. So king a5 is probably the only move in the position. Unless you want to go back. And now it's even worse. I don't understand why Smyslov didn't resign. This is just extraordinary to me. Okay, so creates a passed pawn. And finally gives up uh, the rook. And this was it. King e4 played. Knight b6 played. King takes e5. Knight d7 check. And if you go king f6, here he resigned, but if you go, not king f6, let's say king e6, then I just go king c7, and if you go here, then I just defend my pawn with knight e5, and on king e6, I can just go knight f3, take the pawn. When I take the last pawn, which I can always do, you can never take the g6 pawn because the h pawn queens. So, this game I decided to show you because it was a win for Botvinnik, uh, it wasn't the most precise game, Smyslov blundered uh, at some point, but I still think it was interesting because he made a very, very thematic mistake that's engine approved. If you play the Karo Khan and you play bishop f5, this should be a familiar position to you. a6 is risky. The engine says it's fine, but the engine plays perfectly. This sort of attack with rook c1 and c5, c6 can be devastating. Okay, now on to the Tal Botvinnik matches. So, in 1960, Tal defeated Botvinnik 12 and a half, 8 and a half. The first game I'm going to show you is the round 9 game from this match. So, in the first, in the first match, Tal won convincingly. In the second match, Botvinnik won convincingly. And it was because of the Karo Khan. So we're going to have a look at one game from the 1960 match and then two games from the 1961 match. Okay, uh, e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3 classical, and again bishop f5. And Tile played... The reason I want to show you this game is because, because Tile played uh, a very interesting line which actually many people play today. And not many players with black are very comfortable playing against it. He played knight e2. And the idea behind knight e2 is to go knight f4 and just take this bishop without too much hassle. However, there are ways for, for black to fight against this. There, there, there is a very tricky line I'm going to show you. So, black plays knight f6. Uh, and there are two moves here. You can go knight f4 or you can go h4 like Tal did. Uh, if you go knight f4, black's best is to push e5. And e5 puts pressure on the knight, uh, and if the pawn is taken, so 
let's say d5, you have queen a5. That's the pattern. Queen a5, queen e5, check. And if after e5, knight g6 first, then a g6 and same thing, except that you may have some pressure down the h file too. So I think this is a very good antidote. The line should go something like this. And I don't know, bishop e3, or, or sorry, not bishop e3, bishop d2, or c3. Uh, this should be equal. This should be equal, but I would prefer to have black because I have an open rook. But the other option is to go h4. Now you really have to save your bishop and you go h6. And now knight f4. Now if you play e5, then I just take the bishop on g6 and you have to take with the f pawn. And if you have to take on g6 with the f pawn after moving your h pawn, then you are losing. That's a, it, it's not even a rule. It's just simple. If, if this happens, then, then it's game over. Your king is never going to be safe. Yeah, even something like queen d3 is good here. Okay, so after knight f4, bishop h7. Okay, and uh, tile continues bishop c4. e6, covering this diagonal. Okay, fine. White castles. And black goes bishop d6. Now... This position is, I think, very famous because of this game. Uh, Tai sacrificed the knight on e6 here. Uh, he played knight e6. Now, it's not a good move. But defending against it is very hard. Uh, and, and the sacrifice actually makes a lot of sense. A normal move here would be something like rook e1. Or the thematic plan people usually go for in this position, knight g h5. The idea of having these two knights supporting each other allows you to put a lot of pressure on g7. And this is how people play this today. Or maybe not from this exact position, but from this one and from others. This is the strategic concept. But Tal just takes. Okay. f6, bishop e6. Now, what does Tal have? Well, there's this diagonal. There's the f5 square, there's the bishop, there's the e-file. So it's definitely not enough if you ask the engine, but for a human, you couldn't feel comfortable here as black. And Smyslov immediately, uh, Smyslov, sorry, but Vinik immediately made a slight inaccuracy. He played queen c7. It's funny how the engine handles this. The engine just goes knight d7, and after rook e1 goes queen c7. And it doesn't care about the discoveries because there are no good discoveries. So, for example, bishop somewhere, king d8. So what? Nothing's going on. I would be terrified to do this. So, but winning plays queen c7 first, which is okay. Uh, and rook e1 was played. There was a better move, though. The way to punish uh, black for not playing knight bd7 is to go knight h5. And the idea behind knight h5 is simple. I want to take on g7 with check. And if you defend that, I'm going to trade the knight and I'm going to have the h5 square for my queen. So it gets much scarier after this. For example, if rook f8, then you can either take on g7 or you can go rook e1. Much scarier now. If knight h5, then queen h5. Okay. So queen c7 was a bad move because it allowed knight h5. Instead, Tal played rook e1, and now Botvinnik is safe. Nice position, he plays knight bd7. Now there are no ideas of, of knight h5, and we're actually transposing to that engine line. Uh, bishop g8 was played, not bishop h3. And Botvinnik played king d8. Uh, I, I would never play king d8 here. Uh, I, I don't understand why king d8. After king d8, the engine says it's almost equal. Uh, after king f8, black is just dominating the position. The line is the same, bishop h7, uh, rook h7, which is what happened in the game. It's just that the king was on d8. I, visually, at least, the king seems much safer in this corner. But okay. Uh, he played... Oh, sorry, he did play king f8. Okay, no, no, king d8 was my analysis. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. He did play king f8. I was analyzing king d8 and f couldn't figure out why anybody would play king d8. He played king d8. 
Okay, uh, bishop h7, rook h7, and knight f5. Uh, now, converting this position isn't easy if all the pieces are on the board. So what Botvinnik did here is a very human decision. He gave up a pawn to trade off a bunch of pieces and simplify the position. If you can trade off pieces, you're a piece up and, and you're going to win. So what he did here isn't precise. He could have played something like, I don't know, rook e8. Let's say rook e8. But he found a simple way to simplify, g6. Now, unless you take the pawn uh, with bishop h6, uh, what are you going to do? If you bring the knight back, I'm going to take it. If you bring the knight to e3, then I get to develop my rook. If you take my bishop, my queen is better and my rook can go to e7. So you basically have to take. So he took. Uh, Botvinnik gave up pawn. King g8. And now you take on d6. You have to as white because your bishop is loose. So knight d6, queen d6, and bishop g5. So a couple of pieces traded off. Rook e7, slowly taking control of the e-file. And at this point, I think the game was very simple to play g6 was a really nice uh really nice sacrifice now it is three pawns for a piece but it's definitely not enough uh pawns are dangerous if they're queening these pawns are not queening these pawns are not mating black these pawns are not storming the king side so yeah rookie one trading rooks and queen g3 uh this move was debated a lot and why Tal would trade queens when he's a piece down is beyond me and also allowing a trade of a pair of rooks I don't know uh, if we look at tile moves oh, sorry about this if we look at tile moves uh, I don't know g4 c4 uh, rook ad1 uh, c4 probably makes the most sense trying to make a passed pawn eventually because the knight is pinned Queen g3 is beyond me. I don't understand queen g3 at all. So first Botvinnik exchanges a pair of rooks, then trades queens, ruins one white's pawn structure, plays rook f8, and now it's it's busted. This is now a very easy conversion because these pawns aren't going anywhere. So virtually, I would say it's only two pawns down for black at this point. Uh, and Botvinnik's play was very precise. The pass pawn was stopped. After rook c2, the king came close, or rook c7, the king came closer, so no tricks. The pawn is about to fall, he had to trade rooks, because if, if you lose that pawn, it's even harder. At least this way, he's hoping to trade off some pawns and uh, leave black with just the knight and not enough material. Some knight versus pawn endgames are drawn, but not many. But Botvinnik was merciless, uh, there was just no hope, he played very precisely, he repeated a couple of times, again, just like in the first game, he created weaknesses, you don't want to take this pawn, if you take this pawn, you could very easily lose, and you're definitely not winning, I would say, I, I would like to have white here, uh, this is, okay, the engine says equal, but it's not my kind of equal, black can never win. There's no way black wins. White can win. So h5, g5. Keep your pawn on the board. Uh, this pawn can easily be stopped. The knight can reach g6 if needed. The king is cut off. No passed pawns over here. So now basically Tai has one passed pawn <clears throat> and it's not going anywhere. h6, king f6, king d5, king g6, king e6, knight a5. Uh, a4 played. Uh, he was threatening knight c4 winning a pawn. So a4, knight b3, this is a very nice move. Now it's almost Suktvang. You can you can play uh, g3, h7, or move the king. He played king d6. a5, again, a very nice move. The king is cut off unless it wants to come to c7. But if the king comes to c7, then we always have knight c5, putting pressure on b3 and a4. So king d5, king h6, very, very simple. Trading one pair of pawns, a bit of repetition, and at this point, finally, uh, Tali resigned. It's game over. It's game over because the king and pawn in the game are winning. The concept is, I'm going to give up my knight for this pawn, and when you take my knight, my king is going to be too, too close to your g-pawns, and I'm just going to queen. For example, if king b5, then knight c3 check, 
you go, I don't know, king b4, I just take. And I just do this. And queen. So, a tiny like game. Uh, in this position, you don't have to take knight e6, of course. It wasn't forced. He did take. And Botvinnik converted very precisely. If you play the Karo Khan, you've been on the black side of this. You know how hard it is to deal with 96 sacrifices. And I've played at least three tournament games where my opponent sacrificed a piece on e6 unsoundly and I lost. So to me, this bring, b brings back memories. <laughs> okay, uh, now we're going to have a look at two games from the 61 match. They were both in the Thai variation of the Karo Khan, so the most thematic variation, and they were both very strange. But Vinik just destroyed Thai, just just crushed him completely, and Thai played something uh, I don't understand why he would play so poorly. I'm going to show you both games. They both have the same mistake at the beginning. So they start e4, c6, d4, d5, e5, bishop f5, h4. Thai variation. Now, from this position, black's most common is h5, by far, against which white plays bishop d3 or c4 and many different forcing lines, tons of theory. But black can also save the bishop by playing h6, and this is a move I've had some success with. Uh, last time I played it in a tournament game, I lost, but it was a 23.50 fide master and actually had good winning chances. And the time before that, I defeated a 21 something hundred player in 20 something moves. The idea behind this move is provoking white into pushing uh, the, the kingside pawns. This is how I played. White goes g4, which is what Tal did. And in this position, Botvinnik played bishop d7. Now, this is very similar to the bayonet attack where you play a French, but you've provoked these two moves. The most precise way to play is to go bishop e4, and I've, I've had two games from this position. f3, bishop h7, e6. Now, if you take this, you lose, so you don't take it. So queen d6, allowing this. And one of my tournament games went bishop d3, and I played e5. The idea is... You play e5 immediately to break this control before white has time to play f4, and then you go knight d7, king uh, rook e8, knight f6, and so on. My opponent took, I took, the game went something like this, and, and I won. My other game uh, went like this. After bishop h7, my opponent played h5, uh, I played e6, and he played bishop d3. This was the other game against the fide master. However, uh, Botvinnik played bishop d7. And this is not precise. White should be better now. At least e6 isn't playable. But it's a French defense, or the bayonet attack, if you want to call it that way, in the Karo Khan, where you've given white a target. And having a pawn on h6 is actually good for white. Now, there's something to undermine here. So I'm not a big fan of that. But maybe this was mainline stuff at the time. I don't know. Okay, uh, Tile plays h5. Which is understandable. Uh, you're going to go g5 later and start putting pressure uh, and c5. Now, if we know that this is a French for black, it's a French defense, we know that black has to play c5. So what I cannot understand is why, why didn't Tal play bishop e3? They had almost the exact same position in the second game. And again, he didn't play bishop e3. Doesn't it make sense to prevent c5? I don't know. You, he may have been afraid of queen b6, but you, you just go knight d2. The b pawn cannot be taken because b7 falls and black's position falls apart. And let's say e6, knight b3. You, you're not going to play c5. And if you're not going to play c5, what are you going to do? So after bishop d7, bishop e3, not playing bishop e3 is... I don't get it at all. I think anybody would play bishop e3 here. Everything else seems suboptimal. But okay. h5 played instead. And of course c5. And now if this pawn is taken, 
we have e6, knight c6, and the pawn will be regained. Uh, so c3, knight c6, bishop h3, e6. Now black has not the ideal French, but an okay French. And it's not the end of the world. It's not clear to me why these pawns are on h4 or on h5 and g4. Bishop e3 finally, queen b6, but it's not the same thing now. Uh, now I have too much pressure on d4. Everything is developed. There's a knight on c6. Okay, queen b3. And this part of the game, I don't understand why Botvinnik did what he did. So I think this position is every Karo Khan player's dream. Uh, except that, let's imagine these two bishops have been traded off. But even in this position, with the bishop still on the board, it's fine. You get such a superior endgame here with a simple queen trade. So, so this is the idea. Take on b3, white takes, you take on d4, white takes with something, I would imagine with the bishop, because the bishop is dreadful if it's not traded, and we get this position. Look at the pawn structure. This knight is coming to c6, which means that this knight is going to have to defend d4. Which means that if we can trade that knight off, activate our bishop somehow, well, okay, it already means that knight e2 would be a blunder, because basically there would be too much pressure on d4. This is a very superior endgame. Instead of that, he played queen, uh, he, he didn't take the queen, he played cd. Queen b6 by tie, makes sense. Uh, a b6, cd4, and knight a5. Uh, now black's structure is kind of compromised, but there's a lot of activity. So this isn't the simplest endgame, but it's still fine for black. I would still rather be black. Knight c3, b5. Uh, makes sense. You want to get rid of your doubled pawn. You want to control the white knight. Bishop f1, nice move. b4 forced. Knight b5. The knight wants to jump into d6, but it's not a big deal. The, the square you have to worry about is c7, so king d8. Knight f3, knight c4, covering d6. b3 would be uh, less than optimal, I, I, I think, because it would create a hole on a3. Uh, and if you trade knights, like for, for example, then this pawn is loose once I develop my rook uh, or play knight c6 and knight a5, your rook is going to have to move, then I'm going to win the a2 pawn. So this is a positional bind that really shouldn't be allowed. So bishop c4 played, but now there's a lot of play. Now there's a potential passed pawn here, and the knight is hanging. So I, I don't know. On the other hand, if you play rook b1, then I win the a2 pawn. I, I don't know. The engine actually does say... Uh, uh, sorry, on b3 we can do all of this later, I just take the knight. Yeah, stupid. Uh, knight c4 actually breaks the connection uh, be, uh, between the bishop and the knight. But even if it if this knight wasn't hanging, knight a3 is still a very good idea. That positional bind idea I wanted to show you. Actually won two Karakan games with the rook on a3. Okay, so bishop c4. <coughs> dc4, knight d6. What else do you do? Bishop takes d6, e takes d6, and bishop c6. And we can already see that black is just overwhelmingly better. The reason for that is black has a passed pawn, potential passed pawn, which is going to become an actual passed pawn, which can be defended. There's pressure on a2 and you can never play a3 or b3. Uh, this knight is pinned along the diagonal. I don't know. Uh, Tai went for a trade of rooks, which leads to a simplification that's bad for him, but uh, the alternative was king e2, which isn't good either. So he played knight e5, he wants to go knight f7 check. So takes knight f7 here, here, and bishop e4. And the problem is, your knight is kind of stuck. Uh, so this didn't work well. d5 played, e takes d5. I think Tal is trying to drum up some counterplay where it doesn't exist. Bishop d4 was the idea, weakening the g7 pawn, but just knight f6. King d2, king d7, very, very simple position uh, to play. 
but Vinick picks up the, D, the d6 pawn, f3 played. <coughs> the, the pieces are just very, very superior. Even though it's only a pawn up, this is too much. Okay, and you can never develop your rook. That's the main issue. Your rook is stuck. Your rook is stuck. And if you ever play a3, then I get rid of my doubled pawn and just have even more passed pawn. g5 played, that was taken. h6 played, that was taken. Just Tide is trying to simplify, but it, it will not work. Two pawns up now. They shuffled their pieces a little bit. The problem Tali has is that the rook cannot move. That's the main issue. So, whatever happens, the rook is stuck on a1. In this position, after king d6, he resigned. Uh, bishop e4 was also winning. Maybe even easier, uh, because on knight e5 than king d6. And you're going to trade everything off. Uh, I mean, a3, we can just go bishop e4, or we can go b a3. Maybe this is even simpler. If you trade rooks, then it's game over. If you take with the b pawn, then it's game over. It's just too much. Two connected pass pawns. So, again, a very nice positional game by Botvinnik. Uh, again, I cannot understand Tile's opening choice. Why would he allow c5? Why, why would he do that? I don't get it. Now, the final game... Uh, we have the same position. So the Tai Karokan with h6, g4 again, and bishop d7 again. This is game 18 of the match. In the previous game, Tai played h5. In this game, he played c3. Again, bishop e3, preventing c5. Okay, so c3, c5. And here he went bishop g2. Okay, e6 was played. Knight e2 was played, bishop b5 was played. Uh, once to get rid of the bad bishop, it's not easy to move this knight away without preventing castling. Uh, so he did that. Knight a3 was played and bishop e2 just snapping the knight off. And cd, cd. So we are simplifying. My coffee was almost stolen. <laughs> just, what? What was it story? Lucia is stealing my table and she almost stole my coffee. I don't know what's going on. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. where, where are you taking the table? Okay, she stole my coffee table. But okay. Sorry for the interruption. Anyway, uh, Botvinnik got rid of his uh, bad bishop, so-called bad bishop, traded for the knight. And then he took on a3. Okay, b a3. Now we have a simple endgame again. And if you study Botvinnik's Karo Khan games, he's the perfect Karo Khan player. Because he is precise, he doesn't rush things, he understands how to exploit weaknesses, and he understands how to prevent counterplay. So a position like this one, where it's two knights versus two bishops, but the bishops are very limited, and the knights are very mobile and have targets, is perfect for studying a Botvinnik game. Knight c6, finally developing. Bishop e3, saving the pawn. Queen a5 check. What do you do? You have to lose a pawn. Okay, king f1. Now, he could have taken on a3 straight away. That was fine. But instead, he played knight g7, which is also fine. Rook b1, uh, again, he could have uh, taken on a3. I think that was fine. Takes on a3. If rook b7, you just castle. And it's not easy to defend this position. Uh, but he played rook b8, saving the pawn, which is also okay. Bishop h3 was played. Seeking counterplay. Uh, okay. Uh, again, queen a3 was playable, but he played queen a4, which is probably more precise, wanting to take the d4 pawn. Rook d1 was played, saving d4, but now queen a3. And king g2. So bishop h3 freed up a square for the king, which freed up the way for the rook to get into the game. But the main issue is, look at these bishops. g5 is going to have to be played at some point, otherwise this bishop is dead. Um, and the knights have so much scope, the knights are really nice. Queen a6 was played, offering a queen trade, which is not something I would consider, but it actually makes sense. Uh, I would probably consider a move like castle's kingside or king d7. Uh, just trying to get my other rook into play. 
but there are problems connected to that. If you castle kingside, then g5. And this bishop is wide open, this bishop is wide open, this queen is great, this rook comes to g1, so castling kingside seems suicidal. If you go king d7, then again, h5, g5, there's a lot of play. When he played queen a6, how can Tal decline the queen trade? Tal actually ended up taking. But let's see, you can play queen c2, for example, but now we go knight a5, knight c4. Uh, you can play rook d3, decline the trade, but now we go knight b4. And there's the trade again. You can play queen b2, but again, I go knight a5, knight c4. So no easy ways to, to decline the queen trade. At least this way, once the queen had be been taken, black's best pawn is gone. Okay, b a6, h5, good, wants to go f4, g5, and so on. King d7. Now it's much safer to go king d7. Now you're not getting mated because there are no queens on the board. Rook b1, rook b6. White can never take. Straightening up black pawns. King g3, knight a5. The knight is coming to c4. And Tal takes. This move I just couldn't understand. I, I, I don't get it. I wouldn't. I would rather resign than take on b6. I mean, king h4 looks nice wanting to play g5. Rook d1 seems okay, rook c1 seems okay. Let's say rook c1. Okay. Then you just decline the trades. Let's say we do this. Okay, it's worse. Of course it's worse for white, but you're not trading rooks and straightening up black pawns. Rook b6 is resigning. A b6, f4. <clears throat> there is no counterplay. Knight c4 saves the bishop. Knight c6, the other knight is coming, you have to save the pawn. Knight b4, the a2 pawn is hanging, so a3. It's just, these knights are so nice, and the bishops are so restricted. And black has a pass pawn on the b-file again. Six counterplay, but it's not gonna happen. Takes the bishop, plays b5, pass pawn. It's just too much. Too many weaknesses. Yeah, and this was the, the final trick. Uh, the rook is hanging, so you cannot take the knight. So he plays rook d1. Uh, one trick we need to pay attention to is rook e1, but rook e1 we just go king f6. And if you play rook here, then rook c4, and you lose your. You basically lose the exchange. So after knight e5, he played rook d1. But now king d6, bishop e4 was played, and rook c5 was the final move of the game. Uh, Black's conversion is, or idea, is simple, just a5 and b4 and push the pawn. This is, I know that the Tile variation got named after Mikhail Tile, probably after this world championship match. But the way he played it, to me at least, was strange and i have to say after seeing these games i i plan to start playing bishop d7 like botvinnik because it's less than optimal compared to the normal bayonet but it's still fine and probably white is going to be confused in any case in this 61 rematch uh, botvinnik had played the Kyle Khan in all games but one and won these two games through the others that was enough to win the the, the match convincingly i hope you liked but phoenix games uh, i i love them and i hope they were instructive let me know what you think stay tuned for more chess bye bye